Let's reduce the, the lecture to the second part. Okay. Okay. So, so start off talking about work Nash and equilibrium. This is a paper respond to Google 2016. That what I said is that a lot of work on the their paper gets to credit it because their their paper got a lot of people interested in this classified learning and led to this many subsequent things. But the paper is very important for that reason. Um, they talk about this classified learning and static Bayesian. Each player probably sees a signal, which is their type. And then players simultaneously choose action. It's like a standard static Bayesian game. Agents have subjective beliefs about the map from strategy profiles to consequences. It's what they see. And at a high level, in a Burke Nash equilibrium, each player's strategy is now going to be a map from type to action, just like in a Bayesian equilibrium. Each player's strategy is often given their beliefs. Just like in Bayesian equilibrium. Um, and the, the beliefs are correct. So in Bayesian Nash equilibrium, players' beliefs are correct. Now we're going to relax that and say players' beliefs minimize the KL divergence from the truth. And so it's, it, it, it makes sense in that, in that generalization of Bayesian Nash equilibrium. Um, we call it Burke Nash equilibrium because of Burke's result on convergence of this specified equilibrium. And they talk about KL cool black white or divergence minimization instead of likelihood maximization, which is actually I think, simpler and less confusing. I think the reason they do this is because Burke's paper talks about KL minimization. So, anyway, that's um, Burke Nash equilibrium. So, we have a number of applications they talk about in the paper. Um, including cursed equilibrium, which is one that I will mention, and ignoring regression to the mean, which is very interesting, but I think it's not in these slides for time constraints. The paper also provides at least a partial learning foundation for Burke Nash equilibrium. So I'm going to present the model in their notation. Um, probably not optimal. I mean, if I was try and make this like a monograph or something. I would write all the different papers with the same notation and simplify their paper a bit, but it at least makes it easy to compare my slides with their paper. Okay, so there's a finite set of players, little i and capital I, their states omega in some compact metric space capital omega, a finite signal space capital S, which is a Cartesian product of signals S super I, each player I. And that is each player I sees S I. These are the types I know. There's an objective probability distribution P on omega cross S, states and signals. And each player I sees their S I and then chooses an action X I from a finite set X super I. So now I'm copying their notation. So so you are standing in front of the thing. Thank you for letting me know. That's not optimal. Not to be <laughs> so they, I'm used to putting all the player subscripts, player indices subscripts. They have superscripts. Some versions of these slides I sort of randomized. So the eyes may move up, up and upstairs, downstairs. <laughs> so I, I apologize. Um, there's a Set of consequences capital Y with a against Cartesian product of Y I plays I. The main text of their paper restricts to the case of finite omega and finite capital Y. They have an online appendix that relaxes this, which they need to do for some of their examples. But I'm going to stick with finite omega, finite Y, and avoid the extra complications that come with this in these cases. So each player I observes the output of a consequence function Fi. Fi is a map from states omega and action profiles X into consequences Yi for player I. And strategy profiles, or, or sorry, payoffs pi I don't depend on the state. 
um, or on the consequences of other agents. So if the player sees their consequence, they know their payout. State could matter for the distribution of consequences, but if you see your consequence, you know your payout is. The strategy is a map from your signal, SI, to a distribution over actions, a delta of XI. And every strategy profile, sigma generates a map, capital Q super I sub sigma from SI cross XI to delta of YI. So if we fix a strategy profile sigma, then for each player I, we have a distribution over consequences. Okay. And this, these cues are what they call the objective model. Players don't know this model. Each player I has a collection of subjective models, QI sub theta I, where each of these is also a map from signals and actions to consequences. So these are the models the agent believes are possible. And implicitly, these models are the models in the support of the agents prior. But at this point, they don't have the prior. The prior only shows up in the learning foundations. Right now, it's just a set of possible models. And we assume that each capital theta i is a compact subset of the Euclidean space. And the qi are continuous functions of theta i. So it's a bit unusual from a game theory standpoint that these beliefs here were um, consequences so muddles together what you think other players are doing and what you think the state of the world is. There's no explicit beliefs about player strategies in this. So people might have them, not, not to think of them, all they're thinking about, what do I do, what do I see? And the KL divergence between a model's predictions and the outcome, it's the same thing as before. It's just, the more complicated expression, because now we have to take an average over signals. So we're saying for each signal I see in each action, we have an expected log likelihood. But now, so what's the problem even happening? Well, there's probably P of SI of signal SI. When I have SI, I play XI with probably sigma I of XI. So we're taking an, an average of these things. So it's, it's a more complicated formula. But this trusting is the same sort of thing what we're seeing in the, in the thing before lunch. And the set of closest parameter values is set capital theta i of sigma is a set of um, models theta i that minimize the KL divergence from the true model. So it's very much the same as, as, as what I was doing. This extra complication, you have a signal first and you have a map of signals to what you do. And the expected distribution over feedback. So suppose the player does not know what the true model is. There's a set of models, capital theta i, and it's an arbitrary belief mu i that happen to have over these models. What feedback do they expect to see? Well, they don't know what the right model is. So you say for each model, what's my distribution over y's? And I'll take an average over models. So that's what this is doing. Too far, we're taking an average over all of my models of what I would see with that model. Okay. Now, this, this is a question that came up before lunch, and I said, oh, we, we, I have an example, but how is it, is it, how odd is it to have multiple KL minimizers? Okay, so suppose that Y is the color of a ball drawn from an urn. It's known to contain six balls, three possible colors, white, red, and blue. The agent correctly believes their action has no influence on the consequence. So they, they, they want to match the color of the, they want to predict the color of the ball, but what they do doesn't change the color of the ball. Okay. Outcome distributions here correspond to earned composition. How many of each color ball are there? The agent is certain that most half the balls have the same color. So that the probability of Y is under a half for any Y. That's, that's just, that's, that's part of their prior. Okay. But in reality, urine has four white balls, one red and one blue. So there's two KL minimizers, three white, two blue, and a red, and three white, one blue, two red. Yep. And 
Right. If the agent knew that the agent had the truth in their support, it, 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 that would be the minimizer. But here there's two. And there's no particular obvious way to, to break the ties. You can't have fractional balls. Why two and one? Why not two point one point nine? 0.9? But it doesn't make sense for balls if, that, if, that's, if that's where the thing is. Okay. Formal definition of Burke Nash equilibrium. Strategic profile sigma is a Burke Nash equilibrium. Um, if for all i, there is a belief mu i over the model state of i with two properties. The support of this mu i has to be contained in the set of models capital theta i that the agent thought were possible. So it's mu i has to be, part of this has to be within the set of models that minimize KL divergence given sigma. That, that's what the first equation is saying. And secondly, given your belief mu i, what agent i is doing is optimal. Is what agent i is doing is optimal it says it maximizes expected payoff, just like in Nash equilibrium. If the Nash equilibrium, just instead of the belief being correct, it just has to put only on KL minimizers. If there's a unique KL minimizer, then that pins down the belief. Otherwise, you're saying any distribution over these minimizers will do. So it's this is just a definition at this point. You can take it or leave it. Say, why believe this definition? Well, under the hood, you know, part of the motivation is this 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 uh, Burke's result about convergence of beliefs to the KL minimizers, and then um, they actually have a learning foundation for this concept in their paper. It's pretty complicated. It has sort of more assumptions and perturbations to the model that are needed, in part because they need them, in part because they want to handle multiplayer games. Um, I, I'm going to skip over the learning model because I'm going to give a later paper sharper results. I said their paper is really important for starting with literature, but I think that the learning model itself is, is maybe not as sharp as it could be. But let's talk about some of the application that they have. Uh, I saw that the results, so I put it along. Okay, we can find an equilibrium. So you're told to ask, is there one? Right? Instead of knowing the properties of an equilibrium concept, is that useful if it needn't exist? So um, theorem, there's two different sufficient conditions I can give you for a Burke Nash equilibrium existing. Okay. This one is in their paper. That every model, every in every Q theta can be approximated by a model where every feasible observation has full support. Okay. Um, there's a alternative not nested assumption, which is that the subjective models Q theta and the truth are mutually absolutely continuous. Yes, yes, okay. So Q sub delta sub X, what is it? I'll pick up that one, I'll start then. Good. Um, what should we think about what that is? Delta of X is a direct measure on X. And I fall or is that intended? I don't remember. That's good. So I, I have to admit, I'm not, I don't remember why that's there, but I, I'm going to show you a proof. So hopefully the proof will make sure, please. So in the objective model, we have two sigma. Yes. Like sigma is the emic strategy. Yes. And delta x is one strategy which represents the pure strategy on x. Yes. Yeah. That's it. true. Okay. Thank you. It's a, it is a direct delta. Um, good. So we, we two different conditions. The reason I put up both is because this proof is complicated. 
And it's actually a very intuitive proof um, that, that, that we worked out um, instead. Um, and it's to note, we're gonna prove existence. It'll be using Nash's existence theorem. So it'll be existence of a mixed equilibrium, not existence of a pure equilibrium. It's, it's, uh, because of the same reason, best responses aren't convex. So pure best responses. So uh, how do you prove this? So we have this original game with I players. Let's look at a made up game with twice as many players. Okay? So every player gets an adversary. So player one gets one prime, two gets two prime, and so on. In this new game, player I's action sets are action sets player I will win, AI equals XI. But the action set of player AI prime is models of player I, capital theta I. Player I's utility function is the same as the original game. And player I prime's utility function is the KL, or it's the likelihood. So maximizing this for player I prime is the same as minimizing KL divergence. My adversary wants to pick a distribution of the consequences to minimize divergence or maximize his expected log likelihood. So the mixed strategies by psi i and ui prime, um, Nash equilibrium requires that players give positive probability only to things that are best responses. Okay. Well, player i prime's best responses are the KL minimizers. So player i prime's mixed strategy is some probability distribution over these minimizers. Okay? And i's best responses are just the KF maximizers. Okay? So a Nash equilibrium of the induced game is just a pair, psi prime and um, mu star prime, where for every i, i's belief is a distribution over the KO minimizers, okay? And the play is maximizing KO. So the Nash equilibrium of this new made up game will be exactly a Burke Nash equilibrium, okay? And when capital th theta I, the set of possible models is finite, existence comes from Nash's existence theorem, existence of Nash and finite games. Now, they don't want to restrict to a finite set of priors. Like even if you're only thinking, even if Y is binary, the coin, it's natural you might think any probability on the coin. You might have only a finite number of possible coin probabilities. So you want to allow for a, a bigger set of models of data. Um, both data is compact, existence follows in Glitzberg's um, theorem. This is existence of Nash equilibrium in, in games with continued actions, compactness and some continuity conditions. Like that. So, we have compact sets and we have continuous utility functions. So why is UI prime, this KL divergence function or, or likelihood continuous? It's continuous because of its absolute continuity assumption I put on a set of models. We didn't have that absolute continuity, the payoff function is not continuous. But we know after Glicksburg, there's papers like by Rennie that give it sufficient conditions for existence in games of discontinuous payouts. So you could drop this absolute continuity and weaken it and appeal to something like Rennie's theorem. But it's just so, so this is why things exist. It's also why we should expect, we shouldn't necessarily expect the birth Nash equilibrium to be a point mass on one of the minimizers. The reason we have existence is from this Nash existence theorem. Typically, you know, or in general, requires mixing. Yeah, I'm a bit confused. Oh, so in, in this model, you have many players, right? Yes. What, what's the nature of strategic interaction between? It's, it's and very obscure, unfortunately. So, so as I as um, as I said, they don't have specific beliefs about other player strategy. It's, it's deeply buried in the model. So the we have these consequences. Why? Your path depends on your consequence. The, um, yeah, so why depends on the, um, the distribution, sorry? 
Can I see the previous? The last uh, second last uh, line. Right. So FI uh, arg argument of FI is omega under stra strategy profile. Yes. Right. So that action here profile. comes not X is a strategy profile, it's action yeah. profile. This is a action profile. Action profile. Yeah. Yeah. So what player I is going to see can depend on what other people do. That's the reality. That's the reality. Player I is, you know. Beliefs, you just oh, have beliefs about other players' strategy. Oh, they, they have this beliefs about what they see. Oh, but it's, I see. That's, that's just it. Okay. Strategic direction is allowed, very implicit. I that's part, part one. Point two, none of their examples are really multiplayer games. So, as, as someone was asking me, I don't know, at lunch or beforehand, why do you bother having all these players when all the interesting examples are one player games? Well, because I'm presenting their, their people. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, maybe some of the data one. Uh, maybe minor comment, but please. Yeah. So, so I understand that you are following their paper, yes. so that you gave the exactly the yeah. definition. Yeah. But you know, later paper shows like you know, actually the steady state of this kind of environment is just a bit more general concept, right? Yes. And because like you know, in this definition, like you know, the, the all actions chosen in a mix of actions, mixed equilibrium are supported by the same belief. Even not be the case in there. We will, we will come to that. I'm saying, yeah, okay, I, okay, I, okay. Give me your paper. Right. <laughs> okay, application. Uh, Cursed equilibrium, East, Eastern Raven. Raven. Mm -hmm. Eastern Raven, this is, uh, each player thinks a condition on their own signal. The state is independent of opponent's actions. Um, this is mm, they're, they're motivated by like the winner's curse, where people you know don't realize the fact. Well, if they win the auction, then other people's signals are lower, so maybe the thing's not as good as they thought. Okay? So let's look at, it, at how this plays out in an example. Okay? So this was called an add in the lemons problem. This is a seller that your one owns an object, and they. Their value is private information. They have a signal S1, and that's the same as the state, omega. The buyer's value is omega plus 2.5. This is called an additive lemons because the buyer always likes the good at fixed amount more than the seller. It's also multiplicative lemons where the buyer likes the good twice as much as the seller. Here it's additive amount, okay? The game was a double auction. The seller submits a bid X1, that's their action. The buyer submits a bid X2, that I'll call P for the price. And trade occurs at the buyer's price P if and only if X1 is less than equal to X2. So the seller bid has no effect on the price. So the seller has a dominant strategy of set X1 equal their value. The distribution of omega is uniform on one, two, three. So this is the multiplayer game. I was, I was a little unfair. I said, oh, all the examples are one player game. This is kind of a it's two player game. Player one strategy is replaced by a robot because it's dumbest, but it's one of the half players. Okay. Um, the objective, so what are the objective payoffs to each possible bid? So if the buyer bids one, they always get the good. No, let me slow. Buyer bids one, they only get the good when the seller bids one. So that happens one third of the time. And when they get the good, what happens? Well, the good is, is worth one to the seller plus 2.5 to them. They're paying one. So they have one third of 2.5, which is five sixths. If they bid price two, then they win if either the seller's value is one or it's two, okay? So that means that they are paying this, this price of um, two and they're getting good, which is sometimes worth one, uh, one plus 1.5 or 2.5 and sometimes worth 3.5. So the value is four thirds. And if they bid three, they always get the good. So they're paying a price of three. And how much is the good worth? Well, the an average value of omega is two. And to the buyer, it's worth 
3.5. So um, they're getting a good score 3.5 on average, paying to value of surplus of 1.5. So the optimal bid for the buyer is to bid three and have payoff 1.5. Okay, that, that's a standard calculation. But let's look at a vert Nash equilibrium where the buyer doesn't have a signal, so no type. And perfect feedback. Perfect feedback means here that the buyer sees omega whether or not they buy the good. They always see the, the value at the end of the auction. Maybe not the most natural assumption. And the buyer's models are product measures on X1 and omega. So they think that the seller's bid is independent of the, um, the seller's price. Was actually right that the sellers bid equals their price, but the buyer thinks they're independent. Yeah. So the buyer has beliefs about has to, uh, omega and beliefs about the price. Full support on both. So they correctly learn that the distribution of values is one third, one third, one third, and one, two, three. And the distribution of bids is one third, one third, one third. But because they had this prior that the two were independent, they can't see the correlation. Okay. So, so, so then what is the Burke Nash equilibrium? Okay. Well, the KL plays so that the path to one is well, if I bid one, I, I win one third of the time. The average value of the good is. Um, I have, I get seven six. If I bid two, I pay off by, well, I, I win two thirds of the time. And again, the average value of the good is five halves. I'm paying two now. And the average of uh, the pay off to three is three halves. So the Burke Nash price is the same as the Kurth price, which is two. Burke Nash equilibrium, the buyer bids too low. So why? Because if they bid three instead of two, yes, they pay more, the average quality would be higher. The average quality would be enough higher, it's worth bidding three. But because they're convinced that there's no, say they have beliefs about price and beliefs about the seller's bid and beliefs about the value, they think they're dependent, they don't realize that by bidding more, they get higher stuff. So that's an example of a group Nash equilibrium. Okay? So someone asked, I forget who, um, before the break, oh, isn't this silly that people are um, you know, ignoring the oscillation thing. So here's, here's a, another case. In this model, the buyer thinks that when they purchase, they should end up with surplus five times. That's the average, is the good is worth um, three, the good for two on average to the seller, 3.5 to them. Okay. But they're actually getting two. So they aren't getting as high a payoff when they buy um, as they should. Maybe they should notice with some disconnect, right? They, they had a model, they made their best guess. And if they're doing this repeatedly, they're, they're expecting to get, you know, on average, five halves or getting two. Should they notice? Well, maybe, but they, as a, you can't, as a Bayesian, there's no way that, for them to notice, right? You, you, you can't just update your beliefs to say, oh, something's wrong. You could, if you thought there was some small chance things were correlated, you could say, ah, maybe it's correlated. Say probably zero, it's correlated, you're stuck. So I said, so here's these, here's, here's the, so if you don't have the slides, there's actual um, explicit references for the papers. So yes, Gagnon, Barsh, Raven, Schwarzstein. So I got the other chart. Okay, um, another example of this specified learning, actually, this is an example before Burke Nash equilibrium, people were working on specified learning, paper, paper by Niarco, monopolist chooses a price either two or 10. So this is an example, why only two or 10, this is an example. And the payoff is the price X times sales Y. The demand function Y 
is linear, A naught minus B naught X plus omega, where omega is normal zero one. So Y is, is itself normal. It's, that's kind of weird, maybe having potentially negative sales, but now let's see what's going on. Bonopolis thinks that Y is normal A minus BX is equal to A naught minus B naught, and does not know the possible values of A and B, um, but he has the least over A and B, but a uniform distributed on some rectangle or square, but don't include the truth. So Monopolis does not know the, knows the demand is linear, doesn't know the slope and intercept is misspecified. And they're myopic. They set the price each period to maximize that period expected to pay off. And Miyako shows that this process does not have a deterministic limit. Okay, so if the actions converge to two, the monopolist would get data that would say, oh, there's a very low price elasticity, you should charge price 10. But if it always charge price 10, but the KL minimizing distribution is sort of its belief would be, oh, demand super elastic, you should cut your price and have, and have more sales. So in fact, things oscillate. Whereas if the seller was correctly specified, their beliefs would converge. So in this um, responded Puzo setting, the game is correctly specified given a strategy profile sigma. If for all players I, for the model theta I, I think it's possible that such that Q theta I equals QI sigma for all possible SI and XI. The game is correctly specified if it's correctly specified at every strategy profile sigma. Otherwise, it's misspecified. Okay. Another definition, the game is strongly identified given sigma if all players I, if both theta one I and theta two I are KL minimizers given sigma, then they have the same distribution on consequences. So it's not quite the same as unique KL minimizer. See, these two different things are minimizers given sigma, they're observationally indistinguishable, which is not the case in the other examples. You could easily have multiple KL minimizers, like an abandoned problem, but right? even if you're correctly specified, if I play left, all sorts of beliefs about right could be observationally indistinguishable and be different. Okay? Um, because here it's the same for all S and X. That's, that's, that's why I say strongly identified. Proposition of Spondo Puzo. Work Nash equilibrium is equivalent to Nash equilibrium if the game is correctly specified and strongly identified. But you need correctly specified to learn the truth. But that's not enough to have Nash equilibrium because Nash, you know what happens if you play right, even if you've never played right at all. So what is the result instead? If you don't have identification, it will say profile sigma is a unitary self-confirming equilibrium. If for each player i, there's some belief over theta i, such that for each si, and each xi that has positive probability, we have two things being true, that xi is the best response to beliefs, as we expect in all these equilibrium definitions, and the distribution over consequences given mu i is the same as that under sigma. So this is weaker than strong identification, because here we're just saying, we have the same distribution on consequences with beliefs and, and sigma. We're not saying that if you play something different, you couldn't tell them apart. But again, in an in abandoned problem, if I go out, I have all kinds of beliefs about in and self confirming equilibrium. And Burke Nash equilibrium is equivalent to unitary self confirming equilibrium 
if the game was correctly specified for all C. Elaborate on this bandit example. So out gives zero. That's outcome Y not. In leads to by nature with outcomes Y1 and Y minus one. Chaos plus one and minus one. So no signals. It's a complete information game. The state space omega is either omega point one or omega point six. So that's the probability of Y1. It's only two. two you don't, you don't know the probability of y1, it's either 0.1 or 0.6. And the true distribution corresponds to 0.6. So the agent's correctly specified. Okay? The feedback function, agent sees the realized outcome. The game's not strongly identified. The agent sees the realized outcome. If they play out, they see y0. But does not tell them anything about the distribution of nature's movement. If they play in, unique KO minimizer is the true model because they getting that data. So out together with a view of omega point one being point nine is Burton Nash, because with that belief, out is better than in. You think it's pretty likely if it's a um, bad outcome. It's not a Nash equilibrium because the agent's beliefs about playing it are wrong, but it's a unitary self-confirming equilibrium. Proposition: If the game is correctly specified at sigma, well, you can completely only at sigma, and sigma is a Burton Nash equilibrium, then it's self-confirming. Of course, if the game isn't correctly specified, Burton Nash isn't necessarily self-confirming. Self-confirming equilibrium says people get the path of play correct. You might be wrong with stuff you've never seen, but you learn the path of play. Implicitly, that makes sense if the agent is correctly specified. If it's incorrectly specified, even on the path of play, they can be wrong. Okay, someone at lunch asked me about applications to macro. So I happen to have two very short slides mentioning macro applications. So Puyo Malabi, who's now here, he's calling it Northwestern, um, extended this EP model to recursive dynamic general equilibrium. It's a hardcore theoretical macro model with the chain of agents continue with actions, so on and so forth. Prices and choices are determined simultaneously with price taking behavior and market clearing. And the economy of state variables that vary over time, it sort of fits for macro and stochastic fluctuations. So it's, instead of talking about a steady state of a process, you have ergodic distributions of the process. Um, and so now he's gonna need the more complicated probability theory tools. These are the results. It's a, working on finite markup chains, which are sort of, I think I can get my head around. He looks at results of continuous markup chains, which can be more complicated. Um, and that's both versus distributions, actually beliefs. And instead of beliefs minimizing KL divergence, they minimize weighted KL divergence because the state changes. You have to have some weights depending on the fluctuations of the state. This, um, a bit like what Espando and Puzo do in a later paper on Markov equilibrium and this specification, Espando and Puzo 2021. Um, so, again, why should people be misspecified? Well, like Espando and Puzo, he defends misspecified learning as a way to relax full rationality while letting behavior be endogenous. I didn't mention this, but I said Espando and Puzo um, reinterpreted the Christ equilibrium through the lens of the specification ended up in the same place. You could ask, what is the gain of talking about misspecification than just writing down Kirsch equilibrium? Well, the thing is, well, it's always behavioral features, people observing data, you write that behavioral model, but maybe we have more um, intuition for what people's priors are, and we can more easily test that than just writing things down. So it's a way of grounding things a bit and cutting down degrees of freedom is sort of an argument for why to use this argument. Also, there's a long tradition in macro of looking at models with misspecified uh, or only boundary rational learning, going back to Margaret Gray's work on least squares learning in macro. Um, Sargent has a sequence of papers on um, 
agents who are found to be rational or misspecified during the macro. And then you have Marcet Sargent, Jones and Sargent, Preston, on and on and on. So there's lots of papers you know, in this thing. That's it. So for people are interested in macro, it's more of a reference list. I, I, I'm not going to try and go through the papers. Was, was there a question I put off? My can questions? Okay, so now um, let, me, let me tell you about uh, a paper with Giacomo Nazani and Philip Strzok on their specified learning. I said I, I didn't present the learning's result from Fondapuso because ours is better. It's six years later, five years later. So it's, it's um, more. And um, we have a, a sharper condition for an action to be a limit point of the learning process. And we characterize the actions or limit points for nearby beliefs. And Conditions for action have positive probability of being a limit outcome. So the main difference is from the EP model I didn't show you, their learning model. The learning model, they add stochastic shocks to pay off, just move things out, which is fine, it's not necessary. Um, we, don't import, we don't impose functional form restrictions on the objective function or on the, on the objective data process of subjective models. We don't assume myopia. I think it's probably the most important. Their, their learning model for agents were myopic, and, and we don't. Um, and, we, and we relate limited outcomes to refinements of Burke Nash. Okay? So a uniform Burke Nash equilibrium is an action that's the best applied to any mixture over minimized, as opposed to at least one. And a uniformly strict Burke Nash equilibrium is an action that's the strict best applied. All of the minimizers. Any we show that any limit point must be not only Burke Nash but a uniform Burke Nash. And uniformly strict Burke Nash are uniformly stable, meaning that if you start near them, you convert to them with high probability. Conversely, uniformly stable Burke Nash must be uniformly strict. This is this is the summary results. I'm, I'm going to explain this in, in the following slides. Okay. Uh, again, on the summary front, we'll say that equilibrium are positively attractive if they have positive probability of happening no matter what the prior is. And uniformly strict Burke Nash are positively attractive under different types of misspecification. Causation neglect. Or agent mistakenly thinks their action doesn't change the outcome distribution, or subjective bandits, or the agent thinks that outcomes observed by one action have no information about what happens under other actions, really they do, or in super modular, in super modular environment, extreme equilibrium are positively attractive. So that's that's a, that's what he claims. Let me get into the actual model. So um, we're going to look at the model for single agent. So people ask, why have all these agents? So here we just have one agent. So we'll talk about Burke Nash equilibrium. And sometimes when I give this paper, audience members complain, why do you call it equilibrium in a one-player setting? Well, it's a one-player game, it's still a game, and it's, it's going to be used, it's because we relate to many states, I think it's just, just warning, one player only, okay? Each period T, the agent chooses an action A from a finite set capital. So I don't have to have player subscripts anymore. Makes the notation a little cleaner. It's a finite set of outcomes, capital Y. The action has two consequences. It induces an objective probability distribution over outcomes, P star. So P star depends on A. Different actions you take can change distribution over outcomes. And it directly influences the agent's payoff, which is payoff depends on the action and the outcome. That Capital P be the space of all outcome dependent outcome distributions. So each action A is some distribution over Ys. The elements of this are P, and so P is a vector with components PA for each action A. Agents Bayesian, they don't know P. They have a prior mu naught on P. Capital theta is the support of the prior. It's so all the Vectors P are really popular. And the agent might be misspecified. P star might not be in capital state. History is just a 
sequence of actions and outcomes. A policy for the agent says, given the history I've seen, what do I do? That's a pure policy, not a mixed action. The agent wants to maximize discount utility, discount factor beta. Let A super M of mu be the set of myopic best replies. So I'm not assuming the agent is myopic, but I can still define myopic best replies. Things to maximize expected utility. If you had a given P, you would know EPA. We don't know P, so we have to take an expectation. Here's how I think. So, yeah, we want the optimal policy. And when we define the optimal policy, we don't need the, the assumption that agent is Bayesian. Is it correct? Um, I'm assuming the agent station um, already here. Yes, so it's awful policy for the Bayesian agent. Yeah, but uh, my question is that uh, whether this assumption is needed or not when defining optimal policy. Well, I think the way we use it is, you'll see, in, in order for it to have any bite, if I don't tell you what it means to be optimal, it, it doesn't mean anything. So. You can maybe relax it, but I need something. I mean, but for this talk, optimal means maximizing expected discount utility. Um, so we'll say that two outcome distributions P and P prime are observationally equivalent under action A, right? That P sim P tilde, if given action A, they have the same distribution. So it might be that a different action, you can tell these vectors apart. But given this action, they're the same. And let so this calligraphic E sub A of P be all the outcome distributions in theta for observation equivalent to P under action A. Yeah. Awesome. That's gonna matter because we, we, we don't want to assume agents have lots of data on, on every action. For each action A, let theta A be the likelihood maximizers or KL minimizers. So you can do this two different ways, but it's the P's that maximize the expected um, likelihood, or it's the P's that minimize the divergence. So we'll stick a minus sign here and add this constant. Okay, let me define formally those things I mentioned before. Action A is a uniform for national equilibrium. If for every tail minimizing P in theta of A, there's some belief over observationally equivalent distributions, nu in distribution over epsilon A of P, such that A is optimal. So we aren't saying that your um, the action is optimal given a minimizer, it's optimal given something that's observationally equivalent. It's a uniformly strict equilibrium if the action A, singleton action, is unique myopic best reply to belief nu or any belief nu with the KL minimizer. So if you believe any KL minimizer, you have only one much myopically optimal thing to do. Nothing's dynamically optimal, nothing the policy is just definition. If you just correctly specified, then uniform Burke Nash equilibria. It's the same as Burke Nash equilibria, it's the same as self confirming. Because if you're playing action A, there's a unique KL minimizer for action A, namely the truth. If you get the path right, you could get the other things right. Technical is simplifying assumption for all P and theta, P and P star are mutually absolutely continuous. Okay. So we don't need that. Relax in the paper, but I'm, I'm going to assume that you don't. That one is at least a familiar assumption. A second assumption we made that I should explain a bit is that the prior theta has sub exponential decay. That one might be less familiar. So, because there's a function phi from the positive numbers to r, says that for every p in theta and every epsilon, 
the prior probability of epsilon ball over P is at least five. So this is a form of that phi positivity that I mentioned informally before lunch. And this fix the function phi, and not this at all. And we want to find the property that the, the limit of k over n exponent of n is infinity. So this is saying this allows tires to go to zero on the boundary of the simplex. Suppose that we have a, a coin flip, so our priors over P. If uniform distribution meets this condition. The Dirichlet distribution, the gamma distribution, goes to zero at the endpoints, um, but it meets this condition because it goes to zero at the endpoints polynomially. What's, what what this, this condition of the exponent is saying, you can't the, the weight can't go to zero too too quickly on the boundaries. So an intuition for this, we know Bayes' rule does terrible on things that are probably zero. Well, if you're getting really near zero really, really quickly, you might think well, that's kind of like zero. It's kind of bad. And in fact, um, I have an earlier paper with Kevin Hu and Lawrence Imhoff that shows some weird things that can happen with priors that don't have sub exponential decay, and then shows some nice things that happen when they do. So that's sort of a motivation assumption. It's, it's satisfied by Dirichlet. It's not a crazy assumption. It definitely rules these things out. Theorem, if actions converge to um, some particular A with positive probability, A has to be a uniform Burke Nash equation. The Burke Nash is, is, is too weak a uh, solution. And other results for Burke Nash either require you to assume myopic, which I didn't assume, or payoff shocks as respond to Puzo, or a finite support prior. But there are these other related uh, results by Spawn the Puzo, Kirikajimi, Ishii, and Gora and Halsey. So, you know, so you know, uh, more restrictive conditions and also weaker conclusion. They talk about it has to be Burke Nash, we're saying it has to be uniform Burke Nash. So it's a sharper, sharper conclusion. And, and the key lemma to prove this. That beliefs of misspecified agents converge to the minimizers at a uniform rate. This uses that uniform rate result that I mentioned before. So, I'm not going to do a proof, but let me do a, give you a proof sketch to highlight the key steps. Okay. So, agents' beliefs concentrate around distributions with minimized divergence at an exponential rate via the KT independent that's uniform over the sample realizations. And it's to get this uniform rate. That we need that sub exponential decay condition. If we didn't have that condition on the prior, we wouldn't be guaranteed how quickly the beliefs converge. They can converge really slowly. If the agent does play in the limit, then beliefs about what happens on the A, um, so, so if the agent plays A, the empirical frequency converges to P star. That's this law of launch domains. Now, the difference between the true empirical frequency and this theoretical value P star is a random walk. And it oscillates in the direction of a different um, minimizers. By the central limit theorem, these oscillations grow out at rate one over root T. I guess departures from, from the mean, and that's slower than the exponential concentration of beliefs. So beliefs, the, the empirical frequency goes off, I'll be 50, 50, it goes off in one direction, three quarters, one quarter. And then when it's off there, beliefs converge fast enough that beliefs start thinking three quarter, one quarter. And then the empirical frequency shifts back and beliefs catch up. So, so it matters that beliefs are adjusting quicker than the thing is swinging back and forth. 
So we can use an extension of a second Borel Borel Cantelli lemma. So Borel Cantelli lemmas are things zero one laws about things that are probably zero, probably one, depending on stuff. Usually stated for you know, independent IV events. But it turns out if things that period one and period thousand aren't very correlated and the correlation diminishes with time, you still have zero one laws. So that's what I mean by an extension of the Borel Cantelli lemma. So that shows that infinitely often the least concentrate around every minimizer. This is a bit of this is better response to your question, how this work result works, how it's generalized. But then if A is not a uniform Burke Nash equilibrium, then it's not a best response to every minimizer, and beliefs are sometimes at this minimizer, sometimes at that one, at some point the agent just stops playing A. So then we couldn't converge to A. So if we're going to converge to A, A has to be a best response to every minimizer, because each one could be sort of a unique minimizer sometimes. Niarco showed by example that least in different so if it converges uniform Burke Nash, will it converge? No. We already know that. Um, there always exists Burke Nash, showed you that, but there need not be a uniform Burke Nash. One case we're going to do is if the H is correctly specified. If there is no uniform Burke Nash, you know, without solving any dynamic equations, you know beliefs can't converge. These are all the conversion from Burke Nash. There aren't any uniform Burke Nash, beliefs can't converge. So that can be easier than directly verifying do things converge. Just check. Are there uniform Burke Nash equilibrium? Yes, no. That's a static question. Believe can by the way. Beliefs can converge about actions. This yeah. not say about beliefs. Okay. Stability. A Burke Nash equilibrium is uniformly stable if for every kappa in zero one, there's an epsilon that so we take any initial beliefs that put really high probability on the, the KL minimizes for A. So nu of capital theta of A is large. It starts out believing in this set of KL minimizers. Then the Action converges to A with probably near one. Ready? Get the cap as small as we want. And if people start out pretty sure that this is a set of minimizers, they will play that role. And action A is uniformly stable if and only if it's uniformly straight for the magnitude. Okay? So that's what the theorem says. It, it does not extend to strict Burke and Nash are uniformly strict. And John, there's a gap between uniformly strict Burke Nash and stability. But it's a possible problem solution. I can say sufficiently rich in, in, in quotes because I, I don't want to bother. So why does uniformly strict imply uniformly stable? Well, since A is uniformly strict, it's the unique myopic best reply to every action contingent outcome in some ball around theta. So agent needn't be, agent needn't be biopic. And for not only the agent, you might take an action that's not myopically optimal. You might want to get information, try this just to see if it's good. But when beliefs are concentrated on the minimizers, the value of alternative action can't be much higher than its value against the best minimizer. Okay? And since A is uniformly strict, and then even if it's very patient, if you're really, really sure that the thing is state of A, then there's, a, there's not much value experimentation. Then we use the fact that the, that the transformation of the odds ratio between the non minimizer and the minimizers is guess what? A positive super martingale, just like what we were seeing um, before the break. This is something that was also used in a paper by Frick, Ajima, and Ishii. And then we use that to generalize. I talked about this result with Levine about. Um, Act super martingale, looking at the bad periods and how much things change in the periods where people are surprised. So we adapt that to statistication 
um, to and, and use Huygens upcrossing inequality to show that the odd ratio starts low, the high probability it never crosses the threshold needed to change action. So you're down here, the odd ratio is stochastic, but it's really unlikely to jump up enough to change what you do. So the Dubin's up crossing inequality is, keeps on showing up in, 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 in this kind of thing. We'll say that action A is positively attracting if for any optimal policy and any prior, the, the probability we converge to it is positive. So the uniformly stable is really high probability of getting there. Positively attractive is there's some chance of getting there. It could happen. We're not saying big, we're saying positive. What is causation neglect? It's something that's talked about a lot in the behavioral literature. So suppose the agent thinks that the distribution of consequences is the same for all actions. PA equals P equals PB for all A and B, and all P in the set capital theta. So if the agent has causation neglect and A is a uniformly strict Berg Kinash equilibrium, it's positively attracting. Not only do we get there for sh with high probability starting near it, we can get there from any, any prior. What's an example of this sort of misspecification? Suppose the agent is randomly mapped as an opponent and they think they're playing a simultaneous move game. But they don't know the distribution of strategies about if other players are using them. The truth is their opponents are spying on them. Their opponents get a noisy signal of what the agent does before they take their own play. So that means that the distribution over outcomes is different. Um, the uniform consistency of beliefs says that any pair of outcome realizations, any path of realizations, at least concentrate on empirical frequency. And if the empirical frequency is close to the star A, at least concentrate around the minimizers. But causation neglect guarantees that this empirical frequency is a sufficient to fit the beliefs. The agent thinks they've learned this, this state of A, but that tells us what happens for any action B. Okay. We combine this with the stability result to guarantee that once the beliefs get near the KL minimizers, the agent never changes actions, which is why we can conversion to this action. So that's um, going very quickly. I just didn't ask any questions. Okay, I, could, I, I, cut, I cut things from the slides, so that's, I was afraid it was, it was too much material for the lecture. But um, to summarize, all uniformly strict Birkenash equilibria are uniformly stable. Only uniform Burke and actually believe can actually be limits. Um, we have these sufficient conditions for uniform strict Burke and actually possibly attracting um, there's certain forms of causation neglect, subjective bandits, and uh, supermodular. What's missing from the paper is any results that are sufficient to guarantee versus probability one. And going through the slides, I realized I, I didn't really get to Luigi's point about non unitary beliefs. And that's because we're looking at convergence to pure actions. So in um, work we're doing now that I'll talk about a bit on Friday, we do have results on um, mixed, on, on, ah, I'm mixing papers. So. We don't, good point. We haven't actually worked out the heterogeneous beliefs version of Burkean of equilibrium. What I will talk about Friday is a heterogeneous beliefs version of something we call selective memory equilibrium. And I will also explain that this very tight connection between selective memory equilibrium and Burke Nash. And so, so by transitivity, we can get a, a a thing, but um, right. If we looked at convergence to mixed actions, now it might be that 
why not? So as with self just digress, and you, which you can tell me what he's thinking of. So let's forget about mixed destination for a moment. Let's think about self-confirming. So, so we know for self-confirming equilibrium, we can be what are called heterogeneous belief self-confirming equilibrium, where agent mixes between two actions. One is the best response to one belief, another is the best response to a different belief. Neither one is the best response to you know, both beliefs. At least what we just correct given that action. When the agent plays action one, they think a certain thing and without the whole and the same direction two. Okay, so that's um good. We hadn't actually worked gone back to look at this in um work national. So either you're telling me that we should, or you tell me you already have. Uh, I will leave that. Okay, uh, with with the paper with uh you and, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. So we get the polytech Ah, <laughs> because it's a different from like in a backlash. We talk like in a set point of not there. Right, right. So you reaching it and uh, Damien and Ignacio have this nice paper about conversions of of the average to so to an action. So it's not you just not mixing each day. You're looking at the time average of actions, and they say, well. What could be that the average is 50% this and 50% that. So it's a different convergence notion. Um, and they, they use some very um, nice results. I mentioned at the start of talk in the morning, there's all these different things, probability theory, very useful for learning. And one was stochastic approximation. So they use uh, some work by Benan Hoffbar and Surround, stochastic approximation, right, to characterize the steady states of their um, of their possible conversions point so that's, that, that's been very useful. In fact, we've been inspired by that in, in some of the work that we do. So, so thank you. Um, okay, so I said, I- uh, May I ask a question? Oh, of course, please do. Oh, uh, will you please go back to the slide on the theorem of uniform oak Nash, not necessarily strip? I, okay, I, I will. Um, not this. Sorry, I, I, have to, I have to find one. You let me know. You mean this one? Uh, no. Uh, the theorem. This theorem? Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. So, uh, so this says the uh limit, so the action conversion to a with positive probability is a uniform back Nash. But can I confirm whether that converse is? Not necessarily true, or uh, it's not. It's just not proved. I mean, is there a counterexample that uh, of a uh, uniform back and natural equilibrium that is not a limit? Right. Okay, so. Um, the short answer is it's not proved. I think if we don't have this uniform strictness, then um, what it could converge to depends on the prior. So uh, you, you can either ask, is there a possibility of vision to it for any prior, in which case you've got the positive attractiveness condition, or, mm -hmm. or you can ask, so, so that we do have conditions um, and counterexamples, or you can ask, does there exist a prior for which there's positive probability, which is a weaker condition? We don't have mm -hmm. results on that. I see. Okay. Do you have any guess or hunch about that? Mm -hmm. So my guess is the answer would be yes, that, that, there, that there, um, there is a belief that will convert to, to uniform Nash, but that it would need some additional auxiliary condition to rule out some weird pathological counterexamples I haven't thought of yet. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So I think some, that something like that is true, but it probably takes, so my guess is it takes an extra condition, but I can't tell you mm -hmm. what it is off the top of my head. It's, 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 a very, it's a very good question. I just don't have an immediate uh, reply. I see. 
Thank you. Very good oh, to know. Yes, yes. Uh, who, who is this, by the way? <laughs> uh, I, I'm Masa Kobayashi. I, I just graduated uh, the, from the University of Tokyo, and now I'm a first year PhD student at UCLA. Very good. Okay. Well, if, if you see Daniel Clark, say hello to him for me. <laughs> yeah, I talked to him. I, I was his. I was in his reading group, and uh, I read your paper with uh, Giacomo Lanzani and Philip Strzok about selective memory. Oh, well, that's what I'm talking about on Friday. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Any other Zoom questions? <laughs> Please, uh, could you remind me the nature of learning you are shown here? What was the objective function of Z? So my question is, if the decision maker trying to maximize this context. Okay. So if this kind of factor is, so the learning process presumably should depend on okay, this kind of factor. And if you have any result saying that if this kind of factor is high, it's likely to convert it to you know, a particular partnership program. Good words and bandage problem, myopia that we give you. Do not have any such results, ah, well, but intuitively, yeah. let me mention a related paper that shows some light. So, I, I had an earlier paper with um, Lev Romanu and Philip Strzok on a very particular example of the dynamics of misspecified learning. And it's a model where, if the engine is correctly specified, beliefs and actions converge regardless of patients. If the issue is misspecified and myopic, actions converge regardless of actions converge. However, if the issue is misspecified and patient, uh -huh. they don't converge. Uh -huh. And the reason is that the misspecified agent can misperceive a value of experimentation. They say one thing, they learn, oh, this, I, I see this. Well, maybe I should try this. And then they go try that. If they're myopic, they wouldn't bother. And they would, so it's um, the actual dynamic. So, so that makes me um, worry it might be hard to get nice results. So the fact that we, you might have thought myopia would make things better. So in a sense, it makes things worse. Um, so so that, that's the only, so, so this paper allows for patient agent, but I'll, all, results really don't use that. Say despite that, because if things converge, it's the, you have so much data that um, I mean, it's it's as in my earlier work with Levine, where we said that um, people stop experimenting, and so they play best response to beliefs. Why? Because once you have a lot of data on something, it's not much more to be learned. So that's um, a good intuition for correctly specified agents. For the misspecified agents, even with huge amount of data. They can still perceive a value of communication. Mm -hmm. Why we have the non convergence. And why these are those, the, the, the first result is if it converges, it's uniform bird mesh. You get um, the converge, I'm sorry, as I said at the end of those slides, we don't have a sufficient condition for probably one of convergence. We, we said this is a condition that says it's probably if you have uniformly, uniformly strict and the prior is really concentrated, then there's high probability converging. Doesn't say probably not. So it would be interesting to know more about how the discount factor interacts. It's going to be very complicated. It's, 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 it's like, because they're under certain very strong conditions. Yeah, under certain conditions. Like uh, complete myopia and some uh, uh, restriction on pale function. It's yes, convert. Yes, exactly. exactly. <clears throat> but it, yeah, so myopia will be easier than with the patients. Same what happens with patients. Um, I would like to do this. But why? Well, because you know, um, my first working on learning um, in the 90s, I was working on learning games. And um, there we had correctly specified agents. So it'd be nice to go back to like the papers with Levine and say instead of people having uh, full support prior to one of strategies, let them be misspecified and let them be patient. And see what happens, but it's uh, that was the motivation for doing the paper with with Levin and Philip. We said, "Oops, 
maybe that. So then it needs more conditions. It's 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 a very I think very interesting open question, but I don't have any anything right now. Maybe you 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 wish you can do it for us next year. Well, you know, unless uh, you know, we look at the situation in phase that are yeah. I think the problem is only manageable when the patient people on there might be able to be pretty much the same people. When the environment is normal, you know, at the end of the day, your belief is going to be very, very concentrated. So that probably like, you know, the manual of all the way and do the same thing. So beyond this, I do not have much right. intuition for the kind of that. As an example, you mentioned super hospital and therapies. Can you explain? Yeah. Unfortunately, not. <laughs> Which I don't have been struggling. You know, it's, 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 it's in the sense that you know, there's an unknown state, you take an action, and if you think the state is higher, you want to take a higher action. That's the sort of environment. So, but beyond that, I have to go look it up. I mean, so this, this, this I think it was two years ago. So it's not top of mind. I'm sorry. Well, um, no more questions. If people think of questions later, happy to answer email. I, I, I get an email often. So I would welcome any questions about the slides or papers or anything. So um, thank you very much. One last uh, announcement. Uh, the, so you guys can observe the Valentine's Day tomorrow, but the Thursday and the Friday. <laughs> uh, here we go. So I think it's here. Uh, the workshop, uh, the, the first day, full day, and the third day uh, more. So, hope to see uh, many of you on Thursday and Friday.